Okay, great. All right, so hi everybody. So it's uh, welcome everyone to the class today. Um, this is our second lecture. And today we're going to be talking a lot about um, the motivations and trends in uh, solid state electronics and semiconductors in general. Um, as I mentioned before, the reason for this lecture is not so I can test you on it afterwards. The reason for this lecture is to get you motivated uh, for this class and see what all the interesting areas are in the semiconductor world right now, kind of in the research world and in industry. And even more importantly, that you can see just how important semiconductors are to um, you know, our everyday life. So uh, I would say, although this lecture is not one that's being tested on, it's probably one of the most lec important lectures um, in terms of what you gain as uh, in this class uh, for your future careers um, working in the areas of semiconductors, whether you're working directly with them or not. So we'll get started right away. Um, what I want to begin with today is uh, um, we did have a, a small homework assignment. So I'd like to start by talking about that. Uh, let me just pull this, um, pull up this slide here. Actually, how about this? I'll give a little bit of an introduction first of what we're gonna talk about today, and then we'll get to that discussion. Sound good? So as before, um, you know, uh, give me a thumbs up if you, you know, I might ask you from time to time, everyone's, you know, everyone's good. Uh, just give me a thumbs up, or if you'd like to, if, if you have any comments to say, just feel free to unmute and um, uh, fire away. You know, uh, I'll try to keep a watch out to see if anyone has any comments or chats or anything like that. All right, so let, let's share the screen here. Okay. All right, let me know if everyone can see the screen here. And you can either give me give me a thumbs up or put a message out in the chat. I can see it. Great. And Melvin Prakash, you also? Okay. I'll assume that's yes. <laughs> Great. Yes, I can see the screen. Excellent. Yeah, I can see it also. Great. So uh, today's class is going to be, a, like, as I said, a motivation and introduction to the field of solid state electronics. So you get, get you interested in the stuff that you're going to be learning about in this class. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, uh, the, what I say, the ubiquitous role of semiconductor devices in modern electronics. In the world of electronics and even in the world of uh, chemical engineering, material science, we, we have some folks in those areas in this class. Semiconductors play a, a, an extremely important role. And we're hopefully going to really touch on a lot of these areas today so you can get us uh, an appreciation for just how important the field of semiconductors really is. Um, so these are some of the areas that we're going to touch on today. But I want uh, just to quickly overview them, and then we'll go into the details of them later. So if we think about what semiconductors are, so semiconductors, um, you know, the definition of a semiconductor is a material that sometimes conducts electricity and sometimes doesn't. So that on its own doesn't sound all that interesting. But semiconductor devices um, are used, semiconductor materials are used to make a wide variety of devices. Okay, and these devices play an incredibly important role in our everyday life, starting with uh, digital electronics. So computer chips. Um, maybe some folks can tell me what, um, you know, can someone in the class tell me what a CPU is? Oh, it's called a control processing unit. Yep, control processing unit, sometimes it's called central processing unit. And what is that, Prakash? Uh, what, is, what is the role? Pretty much like the brain of the computer. Exactly. Exactly. So it's it's literally this the the central they call it the central or uh, processing unit because it is the, the central to the computer's operation. It is the chip, you know, the Intel chips or the Apple chips that you hear about that are the brains of your smartphones, the brains of your laptops, the brains of your computers. Um, then there's uh, GPUs as well. GPUs are graphic processing units. Does anyone know what graphic processing units are used for nowadays? Gaming and video editing. Yeah, gaming and video editing. Was that Corey? Yeah. Uh, they in, 
these GPUs have a really interesting history. They started off as chips designed specifically for computer gaming. Why? Because computer gaming has a lot of three-dimensional graphics. If you look at you know games like um, uh, like all the first person shooter games, you know, like the, the back when I was in high school, it was like Wolfenstein and Doom, but now it's, um, you guys can fill in the blanks here. But they require a lot of three dimensional graphics and a lot of computer games nowadays, incredible three dimensional graphics. So there's a lot of computation that goes on to um, calculate what the pixel values on the screen should be. A lot of, and so these GPU chips are really good at doing matrix operations, matrix calculations, much better than digital electronics. But now what's happened is that these GPUs have become importantly, incredibly important in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now you guys have heard those buzzwords right now. Um, AI and machine learning are being used for aut aut autonomous uh, cars. It's being used for natural language processing. Um, you know, the, the Google homes and the Google assistants that you have in your smart homes, they're all run by um, AI and machine learning. So there are, these chips are used to basically make computers uh, learn um, given some training sets. TPUs are tensor processing units. This is something recently that Google came out with uh, that's used specifically in, in areas of AI, machine learning, and computer vision. And ASICs are application-specific integrated circuits that are chips that are designed for a very specific uh, purpose in mind. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of um, chips specifically designed for mining, for example. If, if some of you have heard of the cryptocurrency industry, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, a lot of these industries uh, utilize a technique called mining. And in order for someone to uh, um, basically earn new Bitcoins, one of the ways that you can do it you can either buy a Bitcoin, spend a lot of money on it, or you can create, bit, um, you can be given Bitcoins if you do what's called mining. And mining requires a lot of intensive uh, computations. And um, one of the issues with that right now with cryptos is that these, these computations require an incredible amount of power, electricity. And so that's if you do it with a, a CPU or a GPU. If you start using application specific ICs, ASICs, uh, the power consumption of that uh, drops down quite a bit. Um, so then uh, um, basically your return on investment becomes better because uh, the amount of crypto that you're earning in, in response to, in comparison to the amount of electricity bills that you're paying, um, that balance becomes a little bit better. So that's just one example of ap application specific ICs. All right, digital electronics is a huge area. Um, analog electronics, we rely on I'm going to kind of go faster here just so you have a more of an overview rather than getting into the weeds of all of it. So analog electronics, um, semiconductors play an important role in amplifiers, uh, wireless radios, analog to digital converters uh, with regards to data storage and memory. So, you know, all the data storage for storing photos and videos and things like that that we have on our phones, on our laptops um, are powered by semiconductors nowadays. Uh, solid state drives, what are also called SSDs. Uh, they uh, they were originally, you know, originally the data storage elements used to be magnetic disks. Now they're all made using semiconductors. ROM and RAM, uh, the types of memory that are in your smartphones and laptops, semiconductor devices. Memristors and resistive RAM. These are the new types of memory that many believe are going to revolutionize the field of uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence also made with new types of semiconductor devices. Now, sensors. Semiconductors play a huge role in sensors. Um, your digital cameras are all uh, semiconductor devices. They're made from silicon. Um, your iPhone cameras, your Android cameras, what have you, they're all, um, uh, they're all made from semiconductor materials. Photodiodes. Photodiodes are light sensors that are used in fiber optic communications. Uh, photodiodes are also used in something as simple as the night light that you plug into your bedroom wall. You know, the, the photodiode detects whether it's light or dark in the room and it turns on the light accordingly. Um, the photodiodes are used in your cell phones to determine whether the cell phone is in your pocket or not. Uh, then there's electrochemical sensors that use uh, semiconductor devices, radiation sensors, and um, uh, new types of radiation sensors that use semiconductors to detect uh, nuclear radiation. Uh, these are going to be very, become very important in nuclear power. It's going to become very important in space-type applications. 
uh, power. You got photovoltaics. Since we're on the topic of space, that's a passion of mine. Uh, photovoltaics are used in a lot of spacecraft because you need to be able to generate power out in space. So you'll notice that like, the Mars rover has photovoltaics on it. The, the Mars helicopter that recently um, demonstrated its 13th flight on Mars. If you haven't seen that, look up YouTube videos on that. Amazing stuff. Uh, out here on Earth, photovoltaics are, have been incredibly important for as a renewable energy source. So uh, solar cells uh, that are placed on the rooftops of homes and businesses. Uh, solid state batteries is a new type of batteries that's coming out that use semiconductors, a lot of power electronics that go into, um, you know, battery technologies, um, uh, uh, automotive type things and power walls like the Tesla power wall, those types of things are power electronic devices that require semiconductors in the lighting area. This, the lights that power our homes are semiconductors, light emitting diodes and lasers are the two very popular types of light sources that use semiconductors. Now, LEDs are not just your light bulbs. LEDs also include uh, the, the backlights on your TVs and your Kindles and your smartphones. You know, the, the light sources from those are all LEDs. And so then we get into display technologies. Semiconductors are used um, not only as a backlights, but for uh, any type of computer screen requires uh, a type of semiconductor called a thin film transistor, a TFT for short. Um, and there's all um, alternative technologies like AMOLEDs and things like that that are used in display technologies. So TVs, phones, tablets, smartphones, LCD projectors, all use semiconductors. So I think I've hopefully I've convinced you here that that uh, uh, our everyday life would be quite different if semiconductors if we didn't have semiconductors. Um, so it, in terms of what this class can how it can be meaningful is that understanding these devices, understanding the fundamental principles of semiconductors is what will allow you to then um, understand these devices better. And that understanding might just be for your own personal interest. It could be because you're working as an engineer to develop some of these technologies or utilizing some of these technologies. So uh, um, all of these things, the basic underlying language that you need to understand these devices is uh, an understanding of semiconductor physics. And that's what this class is mainly about. All right, so any questions here? No. All right, all right. So let's go back here and go back to our homework assignment. So that was a little preview of what we're going to talk about today. But before we begin, I think, I think we'd, we'd start with uh, talking about the homework, some discussion points. So the assignment was to watch uh, some of these uh, videos, the first two. And um, these next two were optional, but they were all on the same topic. Um, this global computer chips shortage, the global semiconductor shortage. And this is uh, a recent event that I believe highlighted the importance of semiconductors in our everyday life. So I've written down some bullet points as, um, you know, as a starting point for some of the discussion, uh, but we can go off on other topics as well. So I would like to, um, you know, one way we can do this is just to have volunteers. Um, if people are shy, then I might have to just be the, uh, be the bad guy and call on people. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it would be best if everyone can sort of contribute on their own. Uh, so this global semiconductor shortage was, it's pretty crazy. Um, for those of you who might work in the automotive area, in the Detroit area especially, but let's talk about it. So it's some of the points that were covered in these videos. Uh, first question is like, where are semiconductors used? I think we covered that in the last slide, but um, maybe some points related to the global chip shortage. If there's anything on the other slides that you'd like to highlight, let's start off with that. So anyone in the class, um, Janan, Melvin, Corey, Clayton, Prakash. Yeah, I, I think I can um, start with, uh, I think one of the big things was partly, I guess the pandemic um, and everyone needing more electronics at home. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of thing um, along mm -hmm. with some supply chain issues. 
Yeah. So what, when we talk about pe things, uh, people requiring more uh, electronics at home, <laughs> people yeah. are spending more time at home. I guess you know, I I had the experience myself. I was like, well, you know, as long as I'm home, I'm I think I'm going to buy an extra computer monitor. You know, mm -hmm. I think I'll buy uh, I think I'll buy a smart clock. You know, to help me wake up at night, or maybe mm -hmm. like a, a, a smart doorbell, since since I'm going to be working from home a lot, or or camera to monitor my house, you know, things like that. Um, so that was one thing. I mean, that's that's just a a cultural trend that's happening right now. Is that we are just just putting so much more electronics in our house. I think another thing, if I remember correctly from the video, was that um, there's a lag so to speak, in the industry, whereas mm -hmm. um, the, 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 automo the automakers, um, since the, the, the pandemic happened, um, there wasn't as many people um, buying cars, I don't think, and they kind of didn't, didn't um, I guess, request or put order, orders in, and I believe the, the largest one, uh, TSMC here, um, they didn't put as many orders in, um, and now, right now, we're facing that lag to where they are um, kind of demanding more, but is a lag in terms of how much they can produce because they've already scaled back their operations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks, Melvin. I mean, you, you gave a great answer to this the second question of what contributed to the 2021 shortage. There's, I mean, the, the automotive industry is one of those industries. Um, I was speaking to a family friend about this uh, who works in the industry, by the way. Uh, and she was telling me that, um, you know, in the automotive industry, they're very careful to maintain small inventory. You know, they don't stock up on parts. You know, have have huge stockpiles of parts, and um, and maintain those stockpiles. They try to minimize that because that's ultimately what the, what saves money when you're doing supply chain um, optimization. So, uh, as Melvin pointed out, like at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were buying cars less, um, the automotive uh, companies just cut their orders. Um, they cut their orders. And so the manufacturers, manufacturers decided to slow down their manufacturing. Now, here's the thing about semiconductor manufacturing. It's a behemoth. It's a massive, it's got a lot of inertia, let's put it that way. If you shut down a semiconductor fab and you tell it, and, and uh, the, the fab like scales down operations, you can't just tell it on a dime to start ramping up manufacturing and by tomorrow you'll have ramped up manufacturing. It takes, it takes time for it to uh, scale up. So when the orders uh, started um, getting cut down, uh, semiconductor manufacturers started cutting down on their production. And then now we're at a point where they, they, uh, um, they need to ramp up again. And they, they are doing that. There's some other uh, factors that contributed as well. Um, like one of the major ma semiconductor manufacturers in Japan had a big fire at their plant. There was COVID. So there was issues with uh, people coming to being able to come to work. Um, one other thing that contributed, which is uh, kind of like a um, more of a political issue, is that there's a, uh, a semiconductor manufacturer in China, and that manufacturer, um, the U.S. put sanctions on that manufacturer, so that manufacturer was not able to acquire the parts that they needed in order to fabricate their chips. So everybody in the world started going to the other major manufacturer, the bigger one, uh, and, and, and so like they couldn't handle all the demand. So there's geopolitical issues as well. So these semiconductors that we're talking about, they are used in your smart homes, they are used in your smartphones, they're used in automotive. And that was one of the big areas, right? Automotive is becoming a huge market for semiconductors. When you start thinking about autonomous vehicles, you start thinking about um, like infotainment, like everything is, has like Bluetooth radios, um, you know, like the engine control units, uh, the power control units, like the charging ICs and things like that. There are more um, electronic components in cars now than there ever were. And the one point that I'd like to share with you is that in our department, you know, we had folks from Ford uh, as part of our industrial advisory board. And they said that back in the 1950s and 60s, Ford hired exclusively um, mechanical engineers. Now in 2020, they said by now they're going to be hiring more than 95% electrical engineers. So it's something to think about. Now, that's not to say those of you who aren't electrical engineer in, the, in this class would have um, 
uh, it would be impossible to find a job with Ford. That's not what this thing actually what he meant was, is that um, they will be looking for people who have skills in electronics related areas. So for example, like if you're a chemical engineer, um, one of the most important areas is battery development, battery technologies for uh, electric vehicles. So, so it includes um, all aspects of engineering that, uh, that are used in, in some form of <laughs> the electrical aspect of cars, whether it's electric vehicle drive, infotainment, um, communication, wireless, things like that. And of course, autonomous driving. All right, so let's move on here. Um, the, vi uh, the videos talk about what is the difference between a fabless company and a foundry? Um, I actually had a question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so I guess considering, um, let's say Apple um, being, I believe, a, a fabless company who works through the foundry of TSMC. Mm -hmm. um, now we know that uh, TSMC, are, uh, they're building this um, gigafactory, I think they're calling it, or just a large factory in um, Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, does that have anything to do with, I guess, the geopolitical issues um, in China, between China and Taiwan, and them wanting to move a lot of their production away? And does, and I guess maybe, you know, more of like a discussion point, how would mm -hmm. that kind of tie into kind of like the, the current push by the, the Biden administration to have um, more of a, um, um, I guess, homegrown type of um, um, IC solution, whereas right now they were looking towards Intel. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure if there's another company, was it um, Global Foundries? which I believe was an American company, but it was bought out by a company in Saudi Arabia, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're um, global foundries, like the, the fab, I believe, is in, located in Singapore now. Ah, ah, okay, okay, okay. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I was just wondering kind of like the uh, TSMC's uh, motivations for, um, for um, building such a factory in Arizona. Because I think this, hmm. the, primarily before they were building the vast majority of their chips because they're the number one you know foundry they were building most of their chips in um taiwan mm -hmm. but now they're just having like one of their largest factories now in arizona yep yeah that's i mean so melvin i thank you for your comment here you touched on a lot of really important points and um so what i'd like to do is just like just fill in a little bit of the, a few of the gaps here so that uh, you know, folks can understand a lot of the issues that you're bringing up is first of all, TSMC is a foundry. And so, um, uh, so let's, I'll just mention quickly the difference between a fabulous company and a foundry. In the semiconductor industry, there are companies that design semiconductors, design meaning like they design it on like a CAD program, you know, they, they design it on a, like some kind of computer program. And then the foundry is the company that built it. Now, in the past, it used to be that the, the semiconductor design company would also build it. So they were like the vertically integrated companies like Intel. All right. So uh, Intel has been a dominant player in the semiconductor market, as you all know. And what Intel became famous for is they, they were able to design chips and they had the most advanced manufacturing of semiconductors in the world. Um, there were other companies, some of you have heard of a company, AMD, which is a rival to Intel. Uh, AMD was, is a fabless company. Texas Instruments, eh, they have some fabs, but they're some, a fabless company. So what these, uh, these, some of these companies do, the fabless companies, is they will do the design in-house, but they'll ship the manufacturing off to somebody else. They'll send the designs over to um, a company like TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, and uh, TSMC will build it for them. Now, TSMC is a company that many of you probably never heard of before you heard this video, but they are one of the most powerful companies in the world, and that has been made very clear by the global chip shortage. Think about this. If a company like TMC, TSMC suddenly disappeared, our global semiconductor industry would just collapse. That's how critical this company is. So getting to, uh, and TSMC I mentioned is a foundry company. They focus exclusively on um, building uh, semiconductors with the most advanced processes possible. And just to give you an idea of just how advanced TSMC is, two years ago or one year ago, Intel had to make the very embarrassing announcement that um, they no longer would be able to build the most 
advanced node size, meaning like the smallest transistors on the face of the planet. They couldn't figure out how to make it. They actually had to outsource to TSMC. So that was the first indication that in Intel actually had to become fabulous for one of their processes. And that was a, a, a huge wake up call for, uh, for Intel. And this global chip, sh chip shortage has become a huge wake up call, call for the US. And that brings us into some of these discussion points below. Where are the vast majority of semiconductor chips made? Um, can someone tell me that? I think we've already mentioned TSMC. TSMC happens to be the largest foundry in the world and the most advanced. Where are, other, where are some of the other major semiconductor manufacturers located? Wasn't there one in South Korea? South Korea, that's right. South Korea is Samsung. So Samsung's specialty is making memory chips and, comp and the chips that go into smartphones as well. But, uh, and by the way, Samsung is also like really good at making uh, displays, you know, massive TVs. But the main point here is that Samsung has very advanced manufacturing for making semiconductor memory. So, you know, our one terabyte solid state drives or the four gigabytes of uh, memory that you have in your iPhone. Those memory things, a lot of them are made by Samsung. So South Korea, we got, we also got Taiwan. Taiwan, by the way, is an, uh, is an island, small island off the coast of uh, China. And what I'm going to do just for fun is I'm going to pull up a Google map. And I'm just going to put in Taiwan. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. <laughs> just for fun, let's put in TSMC. All right, there you go. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. They have locations in different parts of Taiwan, all right? If we back out here, can everyone see the screen here? Yeah. All right, so this just to give you an idea of why the US government's freaking out about this, all right? Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, island nation off the coast of China. <laughs> All right, and then we have like South Korea here. This is where Samsung is located, right next to North Korea. This is where most of the memory is made. This is where most of the semiconductors are made. And if we just go down here a little bit, uh, another big fab area is Singapore. All right, there are some semiconductor fabs in Singapore. So, and even some in, in, in these areas. In the Philippines and Indonesia, there's some semiconductor manufacturing there. So if we back out here, we look at the world map. So much of the semiconductor manufacturing is happening in this part of the world. Where, where are we talking about in the US here? Now, in the US, if we, semiconductor manufacturing was happening here, Portland, Oregon. And a little bit was happening here in Santa Clara. This is back in, in the heyday of uh, semiconductors. Now, what's happened is a lot of those uh, foundries are, have become just research facilities. They're not making the mass majority of chips anymore. Why? Money. <laughs> One of the whole reasons why semiconductor manufacturing became very big in the Asia because the manufacturing costs were less, manpower costs were less here. And so in some ways we've shot ourselves in the foot with that. And that's what, getting back to um, the topic here, is that's what some of the geopolitical issues are right now. If there is some kind of war, some kind of issue where um, those foundries in the world, that part of the world shut down, it would be 10 times worse than the global semiconductor shortage that we're experiencing right now. We would not be able to operate our military, um, you know, military planes. We would not, like if we had, um, you know, space station, if we had like, you know, our internet, like the things like if we don't have semiconductor chips, the stuff, the stuff that we rely on just doesn't work anymore. Okay. So some of the geopolitical issues uh, uh, surrounding that right now, um, to, to Melvin's question again, why is TSMC building, um, building factories in the U.S.? That's part of the reason, you know, to, to expand the footprint out to other countries so that you're not, there's not so much risk in one area of the world. 
Um, so getting back to this issue then, geopolitical issues, what are other geopolitical issues covered in the videos? Perhaps someone else. Uh, I think this was, a, I guess, a little uh, a different topic, but um, the stockpiling of some of the chips, didn't that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, um, I believe that was happening in, in China. February. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the stockpiling of, of chips was, was happening. And the reason China was stockpiling chips was because there was a, a sanctions that were going into effect with China. So there's a large uh, telecom company called Huawei. Um, there's a large chip manufacturing in China called SMIC, and the U.S. Uh, basically sanctioned those companies, uh, saying that you know that they were stealing technology, and so they're they're not going to provide a lot of the American technology that those chips need that, that those chip makers need to design some of their ICs. So those companies got hurt by that, and so China then decides that they're going to. Be, they're going to focus on independence. They want to have an independent semiconductor manufacturing chain, meaning like they have their all all their home home built technology, not relying on the U.S. And so, um, if they were to do that, um, then yeah, that's part of China's ambitions. They they, they would become very powerful. China also has a lot of interest in, or this is what you. There's rumors, and China has expressed some of this interest themselves, is that uh, they would like to um, basically annex uh, Taiwan. And if if China then owns Taiwan, then you can imagine what the political issues are there, if that means China has control of the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. So now you understand, you might understand why, you know, the U.S. has such interest in, in Taiwan. It's very complicated. Um, so that's some of the geopolitical issues there. Um, so uh, um, that brings us to investments. China is spending a lot of money to uh, want to increase their semiconductor investments in, in their country. They're, they are spending a lot of money. That comes us to the next question. The US has also um, uh, got the wake up call that, hey, you know, we need to build more semiconductor manufacturing in the US. And that gets to Melvin's question. The U.S. is also interested in having these companies come to the U.S., and that's probably what led to more of these semiconductor plants being built in Arizona. So this is just a trivia question, if you remember from the videos. Um, does anyone remember what China's planned investment dollars, the, the amount they plan to invest versus the U.S.? I think you'll find this pretty comical. <laughs> Any, anyone remember? Okay, if you don't, it's okay. I mean, it's a very specific number. China plans to invest 1.28 trillion or 1.4 trillion. Okay. The US is planning on investing 50 billion. So do the math. You can kind of figure out that, that uh, five, you know, 50 billion times two times 10, 20. China is investing um, 30 to 40 times more, 30 to 40 times more than the U.S. is in semiconductor manufacturing. So if this is a story that continues over the next few decades, um, you know, the, it, it's it's hard to imagine like what where, you know, what the world might look like uh, um, a few decades from now. Right. So investment in semiconductors is actually very important because every fab, every every fabrication facility costs five billion dollars on average to build. And something state of the art like what Intel has probably even more than that. So building semiconductors, designing semiconductors, incredibly important to the strategic interests of a country. OK, <laughs> anyway, I know this is. This is not a class on, um, uh, you know, um, geopolitical issues, but I thought that this particular topic might be of interest to everyone, given what's happening this year. Um, any other comments that folks would like to make on these? Um, any other discussion points that folks would like to make? Something, anything that like uh, caught your attention from these videos? Um, not really video related, I guess, but someone at work was telling me that Tesla programmed their way around the semiconductor shortage, like using different chips or something. 
So I guess I was just wondering if you've heard anything about that. Oh, interesting. No, no, I actually haven't heard heard about that. They program their way around it. It's it's possible that, and this is pure speculation, but it's possible that they maybe redesigned some of their things to use chips that are more widely available than the ones that were experiencing shortages. Yeah, I think that's what it was that I, you know, I was literally just someone at the end of a meeting, like offhand, we mentioned something. So I'll try and okay. find an article or something and send it your way. Yeah, yeah, sure. That would be interesting, to, interesting for the class to see as well. Yeah, uh, Janan, you had a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to go off of that. I think it's important to note, like, the volume of vehicles that Tesla produces versus like Ford and GM. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ford's gonna, for instance, we shut down our plans for a couple of weeks during COVID. I mean, half of it was forced from the governor. And that's another thing that they didn't really talk about is forced shutdowns of plants, mm -hmm. which forced, you know, car makers to make less cars, thus ordering less semiconductors and less parts. And then the suppliers also had to shut down because they weren't getting business. And so it was kind of like a, a ripple effect, but that's something also that I didn't really see talked about in the video. A really good point. Really good point. Um, thank you for mentioning that, Janan, because uh, that's something I obviously didn't mention either. The point I mentioned was that like uh, chip, the car companies decided to um, uh, order less because they knew they predicted um, less sales. They were getting less uh, sales, but you pointed out that um, that there was forced closures of the factories as well. So forced closures, you're going to be ordering less. And as I mentioned, it's not like pizza delivery. You can't you can't order a semiconductor and get it tomorrow. If you design a semiconductor and you ship that design over to a foundry, it takes at least three to four months to um, to get that back. So, and once a foundry like kind of scales down its operations, scaling it back up takes a lot of work. So um, I was told by my family friend who works in the industry is that by um, sometime by um, early to mid 22, a lot of the ramp up will be uh, complete and, and the shortages will hopefully um, be more alleviated. That's what I've heard too. Yeah. So hopefully the, the, end, is, um, the end is coming. But th the lesson that was learned during this time is extremely important. Number one, we realized how important semiconductors are. Secondly, like the, the government realizes that, that the semiconductors are of extreme strategic importance to the stability of a country. Um, one other point I'd like to add, which was not in this video, is that the way that the, the most advanced semiconductor manufacturing is happening right now actually becomes a very global supply chain. I know in this discussion, I made it seem like, oh, it's very focused in Asia. But it turns out that Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing, even though they're the ones making it, in order for them to do a critical step called lithography, they require an advanced um, illumination system that's only made in Den, um, in the uh, Scandinavia, <laughs> and that turns out that one piece of instrument in Scandinavia costs like tens or uh, more than a hundred million dollars, and um, that instrument itself is like very well prized. And there's some sanctions of not selling that instrument over to China. There's so many different I issues that ha that happens right now. So. It, it really is a, um, a global effort to make, um, uh, to make these advanced chips. All right, so that being said, let's, uh, let's get into the outline of topics that we'll cover today. Uh, so just you know, feel free to stop me at any time during, these, um, uh, during the lectures if you have questions. And uh, so the, the things that we wanna cover today is number one, how does solid state electronics fit into your uh, education? So most of you are master's students, where does it fit in? Whether you're an electrical engineer, a PhD student, whether you are in material science, chemical engineering, there, I will talk a little bit about the, what we're gonna be learning in this class and how it fits in, and then expand out to just a breadth of topics in semiconductors right now. What is going on in the semiconductor industry uh, right now, emerging trends, um, and then what role does semiconductors play in modern electronics? I touched on it in that intro slide, but now we're gonna go into the, the details 
into the weeds of some of it. And so I'm going to go kind of fast. Um, and this, the reason is because I it, otherwise this could end up taking two or three lectures and I don't want to fall too behind. Uh, you know, we all, always end up rushing at the end of the semester. So I'd rather keep a better pace at the beginning. Um, that being said, we are open for discussion. So if you have questions on any particular area, feel free to, um, you know, we can have discussions on it. Like the class is really, this class, as I mentioned, is mainly for you. So the, the it, it, it will be somewhat tailored to the interests. If you have interest in a specific area, just feel free, free to blurt out questions. Let's talk about those at the time. All right, so first, some of the, you know, the, the drier stuff. So what are the basic motivations, just from a, a class curriculum standpoint? Um, so what we learn in this class is solid state electronic theory, like semiconductor physics. And so we need to understand the physics in order to understand how components, certain components work. And when we think about what the different types of semiconductor components are, um, they could include things like things that go into circuits. That's probably the most common. The diode, the, um, the bipolar uh, junction transistor, and uh, the MOSFET and the JFET. Okay, so, um, oh, we have a question here. Oh, I'm still, still sharing Google Maps. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> All right, thank you for letting me know about that. All right. I'll just share the screen. Okay, how's that? Everyone should be able to see the screen now. All right. So these are the different uh, types of devices. You know, you have the di the diodes, the BJTs, the MOSFETs, and the JFETs. Um, uh, th th these are uh, the digital, you know, the analog and digital circuit components. Uh, I'll mention this, that the MOSFET is by far the, the most common semiconductor device that basically runs, uh, runs our world, I guess you could say. Uh, next is optoelectronic components. These are really important for sensors and also important for fiber optic uh, communications. Things like lasers, um, LEDs, photodiodes, and solar cells. These are all optoelectronic components. It also plays a very important role in um, like autonomous vehicles, um, uh, uh, renewable energy, and so on. And then there's all these future devices that you can imagine. Like engineers are coming up with all sorts of crazy, interesting devices, um, you know, starting from sensors, different types of semiconductors for uh, sensing um, chemicals, um, for semiconductors, for sensing radiation, you know, all sorts of interesting devices. And regardless of what device is, there's a common language that underlies all of these semiconductor devices. So what, what we try to focus on is, is to teach you the underlying language in um, the underlying language in this class so that you can understand new devices. Now, in this class, we are only going to cover diodes and MOSFETs, really. I mean, that, that's going to be the majority. We may touch on photodiodes, we'll touch on uh, BJTs, a little bit on solar cells, we'll talk a little bit about LEDs, but the majority of the class is going to be just on these two components, but we're going to spend a lot of time learning the underlying um, uh, foundation so that you can understand all these other devices as well. Um, so these devices can be implemented using various types of materials, just like if you're making a building, you can make it out of steel, you can make it out of concrete and so on. Electronic devices can be made using a variety of semiconductor materials like silicon, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, silicon germanium. Just like um, if you're making a building, the choice of material is going to be based on like what kind of electronic properties you want in the material. So for example, the standard digital circuits are implemented in silicon. Why? Because silicon uh, is does a pretty darn good job as a semiconductor. It's a good general purpose semiconductor. It's also very inexpensive. We built up a lot of industry around silicon. So silicon is the mainstay. That's the one you generally start off with. Then if you need really high speed devices or you need optoelectronic devices that can work in the infrared region, uh, you use things like gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. A lot of the um, high speed uh, wireless communication devices for things like 5G um, might be you know, done in gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, space communication devices. High-speed microprocessors, still a lot of it's done in silicon, to be honest, but there are um, high-performance microprocessors that are implemented in silicon germanium. 
if you want to build sensors that are that operate in really harsh environments, um, like the interior of an engine, for example, or in a spacecraft, in a in the um, you know a, a fuselage of an aircraft or something like that, then you need uh, semiconductors that can withstand high temperatures and could work at high temperatures. So things like silicon carbide and diamond become interesting in those um, situations. By the way, uh, diamond is a semiconductor. Um, we think of it as jewelry, but it is actually a um, single crystal carbon, and it has been used as a wide band, band gap semiconductor. Finally, like these radiation detectors use materials like cadmium zinc uh, telluride. Uh, these are uh, really newer newer devices that are going to, you know, it, I think, are going to revolutionize um, a nuclear detection in the future. So you know, different materials, different devices. Now, in terms of um, if you decide you're going to go into circuit design, um, it's worth it to mention this might be useful for those of you who go to work at a company like Intel. Um, now, I mentioned Intel earlier in this lecture that Intel is a, one of the, a vertically integrated semiconductor company, meaning um, they design the chips and they fabricate the chips both. Okay, so what would happen in a company like that? You have the engineers with the digital logic engineers who are creating uh, computer chip designs using things like this at the system and a block level. Does anyone know what component this is? Just for trivia. It's Not okay. Inverter. It's an inverter, that's right. So this is an inverter gate. So if you look at this inverter gate and see, well, how do we actually build the inverter gate? You can peel back the onion one layer and then look at the transistor level. This is how you implement an inverter. By the way, an inverter is a simple electronic device that inverts the, um, the, the signal. So if you have a high voltage signal coming in, high voltage meaning like five volts. So we're not, we're not talking about hundreds of volts. A high voltage would be considered five volts and a low voltage would be considered zero volts. So an inverter is something that takes, if, if you put five volts in, you get zero volts out. If you put zero volts in, you get five volts out. So it switches uh, the signal, okay? So the digital designer says that this is how it works. I'm just gonna put this on my design. Um, now, a circuit designer would take this and say, well, how do we actually build the inverter? And the way that you can build it is by using two transistors. MOSFETs. I mentioned MOSFETs on the previous slide. There's a, a P MOSFET and an N MOSFET. Um, and the way that uh, an inverter is made is that you have uh, these devices have a gate, source, and drain. We'll talk about that ad nauseum uh, once we get to the MOSFET chapter. Don't worry about the details right now. But it basically consists of two MOSFET devices designed in this kind of configuration. So this is what's called a transistor level design. Now in this class, what we do is that we focus on um, we focus on the physical level. So once you have this device, the next question you ask is, well, how do you actually build a PMOS device? How do you build an NMOS device? And this is what they would look like in the physical world. So your um, uh, uh, this is let me see this one is the, you got their P substrate here. Um, so the P plus N diode. So you have your um, the VDD, your source and the gate here. So this is your PMOS device, and then this is your uh, NMOS device here. Okay. So what what these devices actually look like in practice is that you have like a semiconductor substrate, a P-type substrate. Um, here you have this what's called a P well, uh, another well here. Again, don't worry about the details right now. There's a source and a drain region, which is like a uh, it's either a P-type semiconductor or an N-type semiconductor. And there's a gate here, which is an insulator, and, um, and below it, there's a semiconductor channel. Okay, a lot of that stuff is not going to make sense right now. We'll get to it later. But the point is, we try to understand the physics of the actual device, how electrons flow through this device, how something like this is made, so that you understand the basics, the, the fundamentals of how these devices work. So how it would work in, a, in industry is that the circuit designers would design uh, digital and analog circuits. They would validate them uh, using hand calculations, using computer models. And so that design would then be used to fabricate um, fabricated device. Uh, the process engineers help out with the fabrication. They develop the manufacturing process. 
uh, they create something called design rules for how to size the transistors. And once a chip comes out of the lab, they, they would characterize um, they would characterize the semiconductor uh, properties and uh, device parameters. And then these material parameters and device parameters are fed back to the circuit designers that are um, to refine the computer models that they use to do their circuit design. So I think the, the topics that we cover in this class is mainly for uh, you know, some aspects of process engineering. And it, it would help you become a better circuit designer too, because if you know how something works, how it's built, then you can be a better designer, even if you're working at this level or this level in, in the hierarchy. Um, can everyone still see my screen? I just got a message saying you are not sharing your screen right now. I can see it. Okay. I'm able to see your screen. Yeah, I can see it. Great, great. All right, so this class is about the physical level here. So moving on, we talked about the role of semiconductors. So right now we're gonna kind of, um, go into some of the details here. So semiconductors play a really important role in digital electronics, analog electronics, data storage and memory devices, sensors, power, lighting and displays, and more. We're gonna talk about the application of semiconductors in some of these areas. And then we're also gonna sort of throw in a little bit of the development of semiconductor technology, a little bit about the um, some of the new and emerging areas that are coming about now um, in this field. All right, so uh, I uh, added this slide uh, this year. I thought you might find it interesting. Um, this slide is uh, tracing 70 years of the transistor. Um, so 70 years was, uh, uh, you know, 2017. Um, we're coming up on 75 years now next year. And uh, the, what I would like you to get from this is sort of a sense of appreciation for how quickly things changed in these last 70 years since the transistor was invented. Now the transistor is, um, the MOSFET is the, the most popular type of transistor that we have today. And um, every computer chip that we, you typical computer chip in your laptop has more than 10 billion transistors, which is more, the, more than the number of humans on the, on the planet. Okay, so um, it, it we it is by far one of the most fabricated device that mankind has ever made. So if we just look back, it's amazing that this device was only invented 70 years ago. Um, the the modern semiconductor industry you could think about is it, it, it was it was born in December 1947, just two days before Christmas. Uh, and 1947, you imagine, is just, um, you know, just a few years after World War II ended. And since then, we have experienced such a dramatic growth of technology. And you could argue, argue that no other industry has had as profound an impact on human civilization as the uh, semiconductor industry has. So, you know, if we just kind of like zoom back here, um, You'll see a guy, this is uh, William Shockley, this guy here. I'm not sure who that is. It look, kind of looks like uh, <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, well, actually, here, here's the name. Like, you know, William Shockley is the one that's uh, sitting down. He won the Nobel Prize later. He shared the Nobel Prize. He's with John Bardeen and Walter Bertain. Um, so this team um, invented the first transistor at Bell Labs in New Jersey. Um, that was 1947. Uh, Raytheon commercialized some of that stuff the next year. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these things, uh, some of the highlights I'll just give you here. Some of you may have heard of something called the transistor radio. Before, if you, if you look back in old radios, they were massive, right? They were huge. Uh, the transistor radio was was a big, um, a big advance because it allowed you to have a radio that fit into your pocket, basically. And we look at this today and we kind of laugh, like a whole radio takes up the size of a cell phone. But this was a huge advance back in the day. Um, people then figured out how can you make calculators out of transistors in, in the 1950s. And this, you can see that this is a fairly large device made of transistors. It's like probably the size of a washing machine. Um, 1956, these Shockley was awarded the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor. By 19, late 1950s, annual transistor uh, shipments, 29 million. This is also quite funny. Um, because you know the typical number of transistors per device per electronic device was typically like one to ten transistors per device. Okay, nowadays you have 
10 billion transistors on a single chip. So it's just, the, the, the scale has just gone crazy as you can, you can imagine. All right, so, so going on, like, you know, starting in the 1950s and 60s, this is when the semiconductor revolution really began. A company called Fairchild started making um, uh, commercial transistors, and then um, Texas Instruments uh, came out with the first integrated circuit. This is where you take a bunch of transistors. As I mentioned here, you take a bunch of transistors, you make logic gates out of them, and from logic gates, you make more complex things like calculators, and they can all be done on the same chip. This was the magic of semiconductors. Okay. So Texas Instruments started to you know, play with that concept. And so an integrated circuit is something that has many transistors all on the same die, on the same little area. So this concept exploded in the 1960s. All right. So um, in the 1960s, Intel was, begun, was started by uh, Gordon Moore, someone who worked with Shockley in the past and um, decided that him and some other folks from Fairchild decided that CMOS, a certain type of semiconductor um, uh, format made from silicon would be the dominant way going forward. He was made a pretty darn good prediction. Um, he said that like, we're coming up with the manufacturing technology. We're gonna put a lot of transistors on a chip to do a lot of calculations. And we're, we're gonna predict that um, our, our manufacturing technology is gonna improve over decades. And so that we double the number of transistors on a chip every 18 months or every, two, he predicted every year, but it became 18 months later. I have a slide on that, I'll talk about that later. But that was the beginning of the microprocessor revolution. 1980s, we saw the first 16-bit um, microprocessors, 134,000 transistors. Um, you know, I mentioned now we're at uh, um, more than 10 billion transistors per chip. Starting in the 2000s, um, GPUs came about that employed billions of transistors for initially for gaming and then for scientific computation, now for AI and machine learning. And by the 2010s, we all have smartphones in our pockets, more than 2 billion transistors in a typical uh, smartphone. So these were some of the technologies and some of the things that happened corresponding to that was basically enabled by these technologies. The World Wide Web, you needed to have fast processors. Um, so the, the World Wide Web would not happen. Internet would not happen if we didn't have um, these fast computer chips. Um, wireless communication, all the Wi-Fi chips that we currently have, Bluetooth chips that we currently have, they are all, all made of semiconductors. So the whole wireless revolution uh, came about, the smartphone market came about due to transistors. Um, and by the 2020s, it's predicted that the um, microprocessor and, and GPUs will have as many transistors as there are neurons in a human brain. So just think about that trend, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, this slide talks a little bit more about that, just so you can appreciate the computing revolution. This is this revolution was enabled by semiconductors, right? So you know, I think pretty much everyone will will make the argument that make the argument that semiconductors are what enabled the computing revolution that you're seeing here. All right. Um, again, I like to have like sort of just this appreciation of things from like a human standpoint. You know, we had the agricultural revolution. The right? agricultural revolution lasted like eight thousand years, and then we went on to the industrial revolution. Hundred within hundred twenty years, we're able to have like these big factories and trains and things like that. Invention of the light bulb. Ninety years after the invention of the light bulb, we landed on the moon. 22 years after that was a World Wide Web. Nine years after that, the human genome was sequenced. Somewhere in here, just before the moon landing is when semiconductors were invented. So you can kind of see like how the acceleration of human progress has just gone crazy since the invention of the uh, semiconductors. So if we go into some of the details of that, you can appreciate that a little bit more. Um, when we talk about computation, this slide is actually focused on the computing revolution. So when we talk about computation, we like to talk about like how many calculations can we do per second and how much power does it take up? How big is the computer? You know, like things that we're all kind of familiar with nowadays. Um, and if, so what we're looking at here on this chart is like time on the x-axis and computational power on the y-axis. Okay, and this, keep in mind, this is in a log scale log scale. 
And um, so this is talking about the, the number of, um, you know, the, the basically a measure of um, how much, uh, how many transistors that you would have um, on a computer chip, which leads to how much comp computational power that you have. So back here, um, before they had uh, semiconductors, okay, they used to build transistors, and I'm saying quote unquote transistors, these were devices that had properties similar to transistors, but they were made using a completely different technology. Okay, back in the day, like calculators um, were made out of electromechanical devices. And so you could only imagine having a handful of, of these transistors, quote unquote, in, in a machine. So um, if, you, if you look at, um, you know, some of these devices, the IBM tabulator back in the 1920s, uh, starting in the 1940s, um, there was a lot of work with more complex computers that could help break the codes. You know, the Colossus was an electronic computer that helped the British crack the German world uh, codes during World War II. 1,500 vacuum tubes. Now, this is the device that I was telling you. The vacuum tube is one of the devices that be had transistor-like behavior. It could behave as an electronic switch. Okay, I didn't mention this before, but a transistor essentially is a, an electronic switch. You know, a mechanical switch is your on-off switch on the, um, you know, uh, on your wall that you use to turn uh, your light on and off. So it can be in an on state or an off state. And you physically move the switch from one position to another in order to turn the switch on or off. A transistor is a switch that is electronically controlled. You apply a voltage at the input and that determines whether current flows at the output between the source and the drain. Okay, so that transistor is the basic building block of a computer that does calculations. So before transistors came about, they built computers using vacuum tubes. I'm not gonna go into the details of how the vacuum tubes are made, but suffice to say, a 1500 vacuum tubes basically took up an entire wall. Um, and uh, so that was the 1940s. You can see the vacuum tubes here. Once transistors came about here, um, you had these small, like these computers from DEC and IBM, they were not small. They were huge computers that were used to do uh, calculations, but they could do them much more rapidly and better than uh, vacuum tubes. And then, as I mentioned, when Texas Instruments invented the integrated circuit, where you had, you could start cramming like, you know, tens, hundreds, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, and eventually millions and billions of transistors on chip. Um, you can look at this time of integrated circuits, 1980s to 2011. If we look back like hundreds of years from now, people will look back at this time and say, this is when, this is thing, when things really changed. That integrated circuits was a turning point in human civilization. All right, so the Apple IIe, um, I was born in, in the late 70s, so I remember the Apple IIe. I remember the whole like personal computing revolution that started with, with um, you know, my, my dad bought us a computer. I think it was an Apple II. It was like cost $3,000 and it was top of the line. It had no hard drive. It had 512K of memory. That's less than one megabyte. It's less than one, less than a, one over 2,000 one two thousandth of what the memory is right now. Okay, it's, it's just, it's crazy. Um, and, you know, the, the amount of computation you could do, you could run some basic programs, things like that, but over um, over the, 10, uh, the 20 years between 1980 and 2000s, Intel kept on doubling the number of chips and number of transistors and the microprocessors. So you started having uh, much more computational power um, the Power Mac G4 was the first computer to deliver 1 billion floating point operations per second. They, um, they had uh, uh, 10 billion, close to 10 billion transistors um, on a chip. And uh, starting in the mid 2000s, the whole smartphone revolution came about. Um, it's starting in the 2010s, the GPUs uh, that a company called NVIDIA makes GPUs for doing AI and machine learning started coming about. So more and more transistors, more and more computational power on a chip. And that's really why we've seen this massive uh, increase in our ability to do uh, computations, our ability to basically have these very intelligent systems that do things for us. 
And it is expected if you're extrapolating here, some of you have read news stories about how Elon Musk like predicts that um, he, that robots will take over the world. Some of you have seen that dystopian movie, dystopian future of uh, Terminator 2, where how many, have any of you seen Terminator 2? I have to ask. <laughs> put your hands yeah. up. okay you remember skynet has skynet once you know it's a computer system that one day decides that it's smarter than humans it doesn't need humans anymore so then it just takes over the world <laughs> so if you haven't seen terminator 2 it's it's a, it's a good movie um arnold schwarzenegger's in it you know um in any case so it it, it kind of talks about this you know at some point the level of intelligence that the, uh, that these computers have at the pace that we're going right now, um, it, it's expected that by the 2020s um, that some of these chips are going to, going to ex, um, uh, um, surpass human brain power, uh, and then by 2040s it's going to surpass the brain power of all humans combined. So just imagine like what will be possible. Um, you know whether you want to be excited about it or fearful of it, that's up to you. <laughs> Uh, Moore's law. This is focusing more on these like 1980s to 2011, but this is a, a great slide to show you the advancement of uh, computations as a result of our ability to to manufacture semiconductors. One of the things that people don't always emphasize is that Moore's law is really about manufacturing than it is about computational power. So background here is Gordon Moore predicted predicted that um, that from the 19 late 1960s for the next several decades he predicted that Intel his company would be able to double the number of transistors on a computer chip every year every year now that didn't actually end up happening what ended up happening is Intel ended up doubling the number of transistors on a chip about every 18 months, so about 1.5 years. But if you, this is an incredible prediction for someone to make in the 1960s and have that trend continue over three decades. So this is a testament to not only to Intel's success, uh, but also the prediction that he made. Um, it's also a testament to the amazing manufacturing technologies year after year, just getting the technology better and better and better so that we can shrink the transistors, okay? When Gordon Moore predicted we'll be able to put twice as many um, transistors on a chip every year, he was basically saying that we're gonna make the transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. It turns out that if you make transistors smaller, not only can you cram more transistors on a chip and get more computational power, you can also reduce the power consumption and you can make the transistors go faster. So there's all these benefits to making the transistors smaller and smaller. So basically Intel's focus for several decades was how can we make transistors smaller every, every year, all right? And so if you look at the miniaturization trend, this is a, um, the 1971, the 4004 microprocessor, one of the first ones that Intel came out with, 2300 transistors and the speed, the clock speed, uh, just to give you a sense, right now we're at gigahertz levels, I'll get into that, but the clock speed is how, how quickly the transistors can switch from an on state to an off state. They were switching at 108 kilohertz, 108,000 times per second back in 1971. Um, these transistors were 10 microns large. And just to give you a sense, this is amazing. Even, even in the scope of today, you think about how big 10 microns is. If you take one of your typical human hairs, does anyone know how, how, how big a human hair is? The diameter of a hair? 50 microns. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thanks, Corey. It's 50 to 100 microns is the typical diameter of the human hair. So if you take your hair and like look at one fifth of the diameter, that's how big the transistors were even in the 1970s. Incredible, just incredible. Um, back in the 1970s, they had 640 bytes of RAM, which is a very minuscule amount of RAM, but they, they had working computer chips back in the 1970s. Um, you know, I'll give you another example here. By the time we're at uh, 2016, you know, several decades later, later where are we at? 2,300 transistors before, 7.2 billion transistors now. And guess how big they are? They went from 10 micron feature size 
to 14 nanometer feature size. So a micrometer is one millionth of a meter. So 10 to the negative six. A nanometer is 10 to the negative nine. So it's essentially dropped down by a factor of 1,000. We have made transistors 1,000 times smaller over the last several decades. And how did Intel do this? They just kept on miniaturizing every generation. And they did that for several decades. So, and as you can see, the mini, as the transistors became smaller, they were able to pack more and more transistors on a chip. Pentiums in the 90s were getting 3.1 million, Pentiums 4 up to hundreds of millions. The core two duos as sort of came out like um, in the late 2000s, the first dual core processors, 400 million. And now the core i5s and beyond, like they're well into close to 10 billion right now. And if you look at the NVIDIA GTX 1080, um, I don't think I have, I, this transistor count might be wrong. I think it exceeds 10 billion transistors um, and they are like around 16 nanometer uh, feature size. So the transistors have become immensely smaller. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, what happens when the transistors become smaller? Your computational power goes up, but also you can operate them faster. So then now we're at 3.6 gigahertz clock speeds versus 108 kilohertz. Again, kilohertz is 10, um, 108 kilohertz um, is about 0.1 megahertz. So it's 0.1 times 10 to the sixth. Okay, so 100, let me put it another way. 100 kilohertz is 10 to the fifth. Now we're at 3.6 gigahertz, which is 10 to the ninth. All right, so our clock speeds have gone up by four orders of magnitude. It's just crazy. It's amazing. And all that benefit has come from just making the transistors smaller and smaller with each successive generation. 640 bytes of RAM, which is, you know, like not even enough to store like a small text file. Now we're at eight gigabytes of memory, which is, which is enough to, you know, store like, you know, thousands of images. Right. So obviously our computational powers have just gone through the roof over the last several decades. Uh, Corey, you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, this might be a dumb question, but um, there are no dumb questions. So, no dumb so, questions oh, in this class. <laughs> so um, does the production of these semiconductors lead to, I guess, better manufacturing capabilities of future semiconductors? at all oh that's interesting yeah yeah you know that's a that's a, a a point that elon musk has been really focusing on with tesla um if you so i, I just to put like something like something concrete on here like semiconductor technology is used in factories like a lot if you look at all the robotics that are in factories right now you know the complex if you've mm -hmm. seen a video of tesla's manufacturing facilities or, or like ford's gms like some of their facilities everything's like robotically controlled it's amazing mm -hmm. to control those robots you need to have semiconductors you need to have high power semiconductors um, to to control them now there's a lot of ai and machine learning to make these robots even smarter that requires semiconductors so the more computational power we have yes our ability to manufacture manufacture things is going to improve as well. So in the videos that 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 was assigned as homeworks, you probably got a glimpse of the semiconductor manufacturing facilities at TSMC, at SMIC, at Global Foundries, you know, all these big manufacturers. And you'll see that there's a lot of like robotically controlled tools there. There's um, a lot of AI and smart stuff, smart um, processes that, that are done there. So the more advanced our chips become, yeah, definitely. The, the 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 more advanced the manufacturing will become as as well. Um, if I can give one more um, specific example, when we start making things very small, uh, and when we start packing like forty billion transistors on a chip, detecting defects becomes very very important, as you can imagine. If you need like billions of transistors working together, you know, to do a calculation, and one of them flubs. <laughs> Obviously, there's they have some redundancies there, but but being able to detect defects is very important, and a lot of um, very uh, um, uh, high-powered computational tools are being used um, to uh, detect uh, to do defect detection. That's just one example.
And I mentioned the robots as well. OK, um, another slide here. So this slide is on the, um, the FinFET. Um, now, big picture here is that once we got to about here in Moore, um, what, what was called Moore's Law, they, Intel spent man, many decades making transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. So at some point, at some point, the size of your transistor, when you're down to 10 nanometer feature sizes, or even 100 nanometer feature sizes, you are ato you're approaching atomic scale, where the transistor is literally just a few atoms thick. Now imagine that. Right, that's where we're at with our manufacturing technology right now, where the sizes of transistors are on the atomic scale. So um, I'm just going to skip ahead one slide here. I'll come back to this slide in a second. This is what's called the planar FET, okay, the MOSFET. All right, this is a three dimensional rendering of this slide that I showed you here. This is what one MOSFET looks like. This is another MOSFET over here. If you look at this thing in 3D, this is what it looks like. And so this picture that I'm showing you here is the, the, the uh, transistor structure that Intel used for several decades. Okay, this was the go-to design, the basic design that you start off with. You have something called a, um, a gate up here. Underneath the gate, you have a thin layer of a dielectric. And then on either side of the gate, you have a source and a drain. And um, then the current goes from the source to the drain or from the drain to the source. And depending on what voltage you apply to the gate, you can basically allow current flow between the source and the drain, or you can cut it off, all right? So that is how a FET operates. Don't worry if you don't understand it right now, we're gonna be covering a whole chapter on that. What I want you to get from this is that this is what the basic design looked like. It was a planar, essentially a planar design. When we got to 2011, they realized that this design was not good enough once you started miniaturizing the, um, the transistor down to um, atomic level, atomic scales. And the problem that emerged is that, you know how I mentioned that controlling the gate voltage, you can control the current between the source and the drain? Um, well, it turns out you can do it as well when the transistor starts to get very small. Um, in this two-dimensional geometry. So that's where the FinFET came about. So if you look at the differences in the design here, you'll see that the gate, the yellow thing here, the gate is just at the top of the channel between the source and drain. But here you can see that the gate goes all, it covers three sides of the channel. So the channel now is this rectangle, looks like a fin, goes through here, and the, the gate region go, covers three sides here, all right? That three-dimensional design was an incredibly important advance that Intel implemented in 2011. It was invented quite a bit before that um, by uh, Professor Hu, Chinming Hu at UC Berkeley. Um, just to give you a sense for where some of these technologies come from, um, he was an academic at UC Berkeley. Um, at, you know, people had theoretically conceived the FinFET, they, you know, people had thought about for years that, hey, you know what, if we put the gate on three sides instead of one, then the transistor performance will probably be better. I, he figured out how to actually build it. He got a DARPA grant, DARPA's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, one of our government defense agencies that funds a lot of like high risk, high impact research. Um, he developed it over four years, eventually Intel commercialized it. This was such a big advance. Um, who was awarded the IEEE Medal of Honor 2020? In our notes, you can click on the articles to find out more about that. But basically this was Intel's um, uh, FinFET design. They call it the Trigate transistor. Um, this allowed Intel to continue Moore's law from 2011 into the 2020s. So they, allow, they were able to continue miniaturizing the transistor without some of the, the bad effects of miniaturization by switching to this uh, FinFET design. Okay, we don't have time to go into all the details of it. There's a lot of technology development that goes into us. Billions of dollars poured into uh, developing this new uh, type of transistor. Very, very successful for um, Intel. Uh, now this is kind of like the go-to transistor of, of the day now in the 2020. Looking ahead into the future, these transistors are at 14 nanometers right now. So 
we are still pushing to make them smaller. So pushing them to make them smaller meanings like the next node size is going to be seven nanometers and then eventually three to five nanometers, which is just literally two atoms thick. <laughs> so at that point, even the, the, this type of FinFET geometry doesn't work anymore. And you need to go to a radically different design, which is called the stacked nanosheet FET, or sometimes called the all around FET. And this, if we just compare the three here, you'll notice that um, the gate is actually all around the channel. Okay, so you went from a situation where the gate is just on top of the channel, then you went to the FinFET where the gate is touching all three sides of the channel, and now you're in a situation where the gate is actually covering all four sides of the channel. The other thing you notice here is that there's actually three channels, not just one. Okay, so if we look at a cross section of this, you can kind of see what happens. The gate where my mouse is right now, the gate is surrounding the channel here like this. The channel is, is going through here, uh, the middle here. Part, uh, there's a channel here, there's a channel here, there's a channel here. There's multiple channels flowing in parallel, but the key point is that the gate is going all around. It's covering all four sides. So this allows you to have superior control over the, the channel currents. Um, even at small node sizes. And so this is the future of the transistor as we look to 2021 and beyond. Incredibly difficult to fabricate this device, but there's been a lot of progress in this, and this is expected to become the next um, uh, the leading candidate to replace the FinFET once we get to the um, three nanometer node size. And at that point, that will be what many believe is the end of Moore's law. Some people believe it's happened already. It's it's more like a religious argument almost that, you know, have have we achieved the end of Moore's law yet? And Moore's law has been just this progression, you know, every every 18 months, you know, it's definitely slowed down over the years. But there's always been this question, how far can this progression continue until we can't shrink transistors anymore? Okay, so that's going to be a very interesting thing that happens in your careers is because we've already kind of reached the end of miniaturization. So now it's going to become about new novel, radically new transistor designs that might use quantum technologies or something like that to, in order to do uh, computations. So it, might, it's a, it could be a pretty exciting time to um, be alive and see how the semiconductor field develops. All right, so any questions about the miniaturization trends over the last several decades? All right. Yeah, so, you know, just you can have an appreciation then like wh where we're at right now. Um, oh, Clayton, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Oh, I see like a red box there. Maybe I miss. Oh, okay. Inter misinterpreted that. My bad. Okay. So there's um, one of the trends, as you can see, is this computing revolution. Moore's law has been the trends in uh, semiconductor manufacturing. New transistor designs kind of come about. This is sort of the future. One of the modern topics in solid state devices is how do we make these types of new transistor designs? Excuse me. All right, moving on to memory. Um, transistors are used in memory devices. Uh, memories, obviously, like the RAM that you have in your computer, and also data storage, solid state drives. Uh, I mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture, you know, before solid state drives. Does anyone remember what we had, you know, before solid state drives? I think they're used in something still. What do we use for hard drives before solid state disks? Mechanical uh, drives? Yeah, or a mechanic, I'm sorry, a magnetic disk or something like that. Yeah, 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 mechanical drives, magnetic disks. So these, these were disks that spun at like, you know, 10, up to 10,000 RPM. They spun very fast and they were magnetic and they were like little pieces, little bits of the magnet, magnetic bits that were basically stored ones and zeros. The problem with uh, those types of drives is that re they required moving parts. So if you dropped a, a laptop, um, there's a good chance that your magnetic disk would just get screwed. And um, also was reliability. You know, like over time, these things can wear out. So a magnetic disk would have a certain lifetime. 
The last thing is a manufacturer. Um, these discs could be like expensive to manufacture. The more moving parts you have, like building a spindle and something that spins, and um, you know having it something to read it, it, it it's a complicated device design. So um, what happened was that semiconductors basically replaced all those. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it, but there's something called um, there's a, 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 a series of logic gates that you can design to store a to create a memory storage element, um, volatile memory or non-volatile memory. Non-volatile memory means that um, that even when you turn the power off, it still remembers what you put in there, which is what you need for solid state disks. So um, what's happened in this industry is that um, this is an industry that really requires many, many transistors, right? It, in the computation industry, it was all about how can we do faster computation, right? In this industry, more transistors means more data storage. Okay, so there, there was, you could argue, there was even a bigger pressure on, you know, companies developing um, semiconductor data storage to pack more and more transistors on a chip. So um, what, what happens in New York City, like when you run out of space? <laughs> New York City's on a, Manhattan's on an island, right? So what happens when you run out of space on the island? Where do you, you build, build up or you build more space? You build up, that's right. And that's what, that was the solution that came about in the semiconductor field. Is that like, you know, if you look at all these types of transistor designs, they were all essentially um, pl planar or 2D, meaning like 2D in the sense that, I, I don't want to confuse anyone. The, 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 the FinFET is considered a three-dimensional transistor design. This is also considered three dimensions because there's three-dimensional features here. But like the, the thinking over several decades was that you have one layer of transistors, one layer, okay? And so when you run out of real estate and you need more density, you start building up. So companies like Samsung figured out how to do three-dimensional memory. And so this is where you have multiple layers of transistors stacked on top of each other, okay? And so that can greatly increase the size of your memory. And so if you guys may, may remember when you were very young, um, the solid state disks were pretty expensive. And, um, you know, it, typically you'd get into the megabytes and gigabytes uh, for solid state disks. Now we're at hundreds of gigabytes and terabytes. So it's kind of like gone up by like tenfold. And that tenfold increase really has happened because of this three-dimensional stacking technology, our ability to manufacture transistors in a three-dimensional uh, manner. So you kind of kind of look at this timeline of Samsung, Toshiba, Micron, and Hynix, the, the major memory manufacturers. Samsung started off with 3D NAND in 2012. All these other manufacturers started making 3D NAND in the by 2016, and guess what? Now that we're at 2018, now we have really cheap, high-density hard drives. You know that that this made it's really changed things in terms of um, uh, media, right? You know how Google Photos is able to offer you. Uh, free photo storage. Well, they stopped doing that last year, but um, the fact that you can store like terabytes of data in the cloud, you know, and there's there's just so much data being accumulated and stored. It's being enabled by high density data storage. All right. So moving on, uh, we're already at four o'clock. I knew that I wasn't going to get through all this stuff today. Twenty six or so slides on this module. I always hope that I'd be able to finish in one class. I think that's not realistic. Um, but I think it's important for you. As, so show of hands, are, are, is, this, is this interesting for all of you? You know, if, if not, we can definitely like increase, um, speed up the pace here. Um, how many of you would like to kind of go faster through this material or how many folks are okay with the speed up, you know, in my sandbox comments. <laughs> I think it's good, it's interesting to me. Okay. And Melvin, uh, Janan, Prakash? Interesting to me as well. I think this, the pace is um, good. Okay, all right, thumbs up from Janan. And uh, Prakash, how about you? Okay, um, well, just you know, feel free to uh, chime in if you'd like, Prakash, at any point. All right. Yeah, Professor, I'm here also. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, pace okay for you? 
I like it. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so I want to touch a little bit about like different trends happening in digital computers right now. I've been talking a lot about packing more and more transistors on a chip, right? But there's actually been, uh, things have gone in the other direction too. Uh, we've also gone in the direction of fewer transistors on a chip, but just making the die sizes really, really small. Okay, if you have, if you have small transistors that are in the nanometer regime and you only need like 10,000 to 100,000 transistors, guess what? You can make your chip size incredibly small. Um, I'm, if you look at my video right now, well, you, you know what the size of a typical C CPU is. You know, it's, it's about the size of your thumbnail, okay? About the size of a thumbnail is the typical chip size that goes into your smartphone or laptop. Um, you can see here, this is something called the Michigan Micromote designed at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And this is the side of um, a coin. Right? You can see this is incredibly small, like this is maybe, maybe a millimeter wide in size. So you might ask, well, what's, what's the use of this? These are sensing devices. So I mentioned semiconductors can be used for various types of sensors. They can also be used for computation. They can also be used for wireless communication. So the beautiful thing is you can make integrated devices that have all these different functionalities, sensing, computation, and communication into a single tiny chip device, okay? Um, uh, there is a professor at UC Berkeley called Chris Pister who, who uh, famously said, this is smart dust. These things are as small as dark dust particles, but they're smart. They can do a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, things. And the idea would be that that we would be able to have sensors everywhere, you know, air quality sensors, light sensors, like, and, and have like all these interconnected um, sensing elements that that we use to monitor, um, you know, to monitor infrastructure like bridges, or monitor security in our homes, or monitor health. Uh, air quality and things like that, right? So this field has become uh, what's called IoT, Internet of Things. Not all IoT devices are this tiny, by the way. The IoT field is just this general idea of like having sensors and smart devices everywhere, like smart refrigerators, smart toasters, like, you know, things like that. But um, th this is one direction that research is going right now, making extremely tiny chips that can be used for sensing. Um, and another big application of this would be for um, biomedical implants. If you can make these chips so tiny that you can swallow them, there's a company that makes a camera. And some of you may have heard of this called PillCam. It's, it, it's a semiconductor device that has cameras and, and wireless communication built into it. You swallow this camera and the camera like takes pictures and videos as it's going through your GI tract. And, and it's, uh, you could say it's revolutionized the field of um, a gastroenterology. Pretty interesting. Uh, some of the benefits of making your chip size is very small. So on one side, you have these very, very tiny chips with fewer transistors on them. Then in the mid range here, you have the personal computing regime where you have like nowadays, um, you know, a few billions of transistors in a chip that's about the size of a thumbnail or two thumbnails. And then on the other side, you have the very large chips. The, these chips could be several centimeters in size. And so since they're larger and they have more transistors, they're obviously more expensive. 2.1 billion MOSFETs in a typical Intel Skylake i7 processor for personal computing for laptops. NVIDIA Volta GPU has 21 billion transistors, 10 times more. And um, these are, you can see that they're organized into these little clusters, like a little grid here. These are called cores, okay? So when you have cores, each core can do computation on its own. So in this particular chip, 5,000 cores means you can do 5,000 computations simultaneously. And that's where GPUs differ from CPUs. If you're gonna build a chip with lots of cores, you need tons of transistors on them. All right, looks like I got another question, okay. So uh, one direction things are going is to build very larger chips with many, many transistors on them. These are obviously more expensive, as I mentioned. These are used for artificial intelligence and high performance computing, scientific computation, simulations of black holes, for example, um, AI. So Google and Facebook, you know, when they're trying to, you know, um, store all your pictures and learn how to facial recognize you. That's um, when Tesla is trying to build self-driving self cars that recognize stop signs and 
and a dog walking across the road and things like that. That's all um, happening on these GPUs. Um, if you go even beyond that, this, uh, this is something you probably may, may not have heard of. Many of you have heard of NVIDIA, but so I doubt many of you have heard of uh, Cerebras. But this could be the future trend. Yeah, on this end of the scale is um, what Cerebras is doing. They are building a chip, one chip, that has 1.2 trillion transistors on it. <laughs> Think about that. It's, it's 50 times more transistors than even the GPU, all right? So because this has so many transistors on it, like it's just a pretty large size. Now, um, this GPU chip that you see here, if you wanna see a size comparison, this is what a GPU looks like with 21 billion transistors. This would be a typical NVIDIA GPU. And this is how big the Cerebras, what they call a wafer scale um, compute engine is. They call it the WSC wafer scale engine, 1.2 trillion transistors. Now, can anyone tell me why would you need this much computational power? I, I didn't know off the top of my head, so if you don't, that's fine. But I, I just, I'm curious what, what people's guesses might be. I guess the first thing I would think of would be um, some large uh, neural networks, uh, possibly some form of um, matrix uh, multiplication dot products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, they do mention one of those things. They, they do mention um, scientific computation as one of the uh, applications. You're absolutely right about that. How about application-wise? Now, like I said, I didn't, I didn't know this either, but uh, it, they're, they're used for um, real-time, one of the application areas that Cerebras talks about is real-time simulations. If any of you have run uh, simulations of fluid flow through a pipe, or you're trying to simulate a car in a wind tunnel, or you're an astronomer and you're trying to simulate black holes, um, usually start the simulation today, you come back a week later or a day later, maybe a few hours later, to see what the results are. And then you kind of like, you have a movie, this is what the black hole, this is what the black hole looks like when it's creating an event horizon, or this is what the, this is how the fluid is flowing over the contours of the Corvette, you know, um, things like that. Um, but this type of uh, engine could do the simulation in real time. So you start the simulation now, and it could be simulating things as they are actually happening, as they, as at the same time scales that they might happen in in real space. So it, if stuff like this becomes very popular, it could really um, it could revolutionize the field of uh, real time simulations. Um, and as Melvin uh, pointed out, um, it's just a monster. It can it's just a monster version of what a GPU can do. So in terms of AI, machine learning, all that stuff, uh, scientific computation. So those are the two directions that uh, uh, digital computers are going nowadays. All right, where are we at? Okay, so we are at 410. And I think I will just touch on this one slide and then we'll uh, end for today. Um, I, this is just an extra slide that I found on a wafer scale um, computing. Um, so just to just to go into a little bit more detail, these things, these chips are optimized for deep learning. Um, specifically, they say training via gradient descent methods. Gradient descent methods is a, is a thing that requires a lot of matrix computation, as Melvin nicely pointed out. Um, so uh, you need a chip that can just do massive amounts of matrix calculations, matrix multiplication, and stuff like that. Um, the advantage of this kind of chip is that your transistors that do compute and the memory to use to store the results, they are stored close to each other. So that, um, that is great because a lot of times like transporting the data from memory into the place where the computation is being done, that contributes to slower speeds, late and slower latencies. So you get high bandwidth, uh, low latencies, um, massive chips, as I mentioned, and um, it's basically a highly parallelized version. So a single tile that you see here, it contains memory, it contains a router control, like some arithmetic logic units and things like that. And that just occupies one little dot on this grid. So you, each of these tiles is able to perform computations. And you have all these tiles working together in parallel to do you know, massive amounts of compute. It'll be interesting to see what happens to companies like Cerebris in the future. 
Okay, so we talked a lot about like digital computation today. Um, just a quick, um, quick summary. We talked about digital computation, um, data storage. Uh, we talked about how transistors have become smaller and smaller through Moore's law and different um, uh, techniques and tricks people have come up with in order to uh, create new device designs that can continue on Moore's law. And at some point, Moore's law is going to stop. And we talked about the overall impact of society. You know, the computing revolution that was basically spawned by spawned in 1947 by the birth of the modern semiconductor industry. So hope that gives you an appreciation um, mainly for this element here, the uh, digital electronics. We touched a little bit on data storage and memory. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these areas uh, next class. You'll, you can fill out your appreciation of semiconductor devices. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch the videos, uh, please do watch them. Uh, if you haven't had, had a chance to fill out your surveys yet, um, this one's not graded, so even if you submit it um, afterwards, no big deal. Uh, so please do submit your student questionnaire so I can know a little bit more about you. And uh, thanks for attending today. Uh, we have no, no homework today. Uh, I'll see you next Monday. All right. Thank you, um, Professor. Professor. Have a great weekend. Have Thank, nice you. Weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, the, the recording for these lectures will be available online on, on Zoom. Uh, if, you, if I can just show you real quick. If we go to, um, if you go to our uh, uh, course uh, website, then you just click on Zoom here. This will show up. So the, the current lectures will show up here. And if you go click here on cloud recordings, you'll be able to see the, um, the last time's lecture has already been posted. Today's lecture will probably show up in the next 24 to 48 hours. All right. All right, everyone, have a good weekend. Enjoy the September weather, and I'll see you on Monday. Nice. Yes, Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.